a new proclamation. What wise men, great men, medical men, professional people have not been able to do, God will do it. All those things that are forgotten, your forgotten strength, your forgotten power, your forgotten revelation, everything you said, I had a dream long ago, and I thought, this is what I will do. I've forgotten now, your forgotten vision will come up again. Passion will come up again. Revelation will come up again. New life will come up again in your life in Jesus' name. Only Christ Jesus has the power of this new year. An unforgettable encounter beckons. We are connecting to the God of wonders this new year for salvation and deliverance. Welcome GCK to Asaba. Delta State, Nigeria, January 26th to 31st, 2023. 1600 hours GMT daily and Global Sunday Worship at all 700 hours GMT. Also featuring ministers and professionals conference with Impact Academy for Youth, Young Adults and Young Professionals. It's a new year of wonders this 2023. From the Niger Delta, the oil of anointing will be transported by satellite and all our social media links to over 150 countries of the world. Join the team in GCK audience as the man appointed by God, the convener of GCK, Pastor Dr. W.F. Komoi, connects the world to an unforgettable encounter with the God of Wonders. Glorious music ministrations by choirs from nations across the world with guest music ministration by Jonathan Lee. Darkness gone. Yeah. Premature death cancelled. Yeah. Yours is now to reap the benefit. GCK, the, the gospel, gospel to every creature. Praise the Lord. Let's rise up and prepare ourselves for the Bible study tonight. Let's pray to the Lord that what he wants to teach us will learn to become part of our lives, will make us better, make us run better. The race that is set before us. Pray that the Lord himself will teach you us. He taught his people in days gone by. And the truth he reveals to you will give you strength. You become strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And whatever temptations or trials or difficulties or challenges may confront you. That nothing and no one will be able to make you turn back and look back. And be diverted from the path of righteousness that the Lord is teaching, leading us to. Every time. Pray that the purpose of God in bringing you to the Bible study tonight will be fulfilled in your life. Pray for our children, pray for our youths, our teenagers who are here with us at the Bible study. That the great privilege the Lord is giving them, which many of us did not have when we were at the same age in which they are today, pray that God will help these young people, not only here, but everywhere where we're gathered together listening to the word of God tonight. That the Lord will get hold of all our youths, write his word in their hearts. And this regular teaching which becomes training for them, that when they grow older, 
they will not depart from this good way that the Lord is putting their feet in. Let's pray for our parents, too, mothers, fathers, that they are growing older in the Lord and older in age. That what we are learning together, we will not be tired, we will not be weary. We will take the word of God to heart. And as our days, so shall our strength be. That as we meet with greater challenges in life, as fathers and mothers, as parents, that this word of God we're learning will make us the stronger. Let's pray for our visitors. Uh, with us at the Bible study, probably for the first time today. That the Lord will give them understanding in His Word. And this teaching of the Word will lead them to know the Lord Jesus as Savior and Lord. That they will become wise unto salvation as a result of studying the word. Let's pray for our leaders in the church, overseers, pastors, leaders in various areas of the work. The Lord has committed to our hands that this word of God we are learning together will equip us, mature us, perfect us, make us always to have him before us. Looking unto him and remembering the word he has used us to teach his church. That we will be perfect examples to the people we lead. By the teaching of the word which we ourselves are sharing and giving to the people. Let's pray that God will give us concentration as we study the word of God tonight and the joy of knowing the Lord more will be granted to every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for bringing us to our Bible study tonight. Thank you, Lord, because although we come every Monday, every week, yet it has not become stale. And it's fresh day by day. Lord, we pray that your spirit once again will make this world to come alive as we study together in Jesus' name. I pray, O Lord, you energize, empower, equip every one of us as we study the word together tonight in Jesus' name. That the strength we need for the race ahead of us, the power we need to be able to overcome every challenge coming our way, and the wisdom we need to be able to avoid the pitfalls of life and to stand firm until the very end. You grind to every one of us in Jesus' name. For fathers and mothers and boys and girls and sons and daughters and leaders and workers and members and invitees, Lord, we pray this word will draw every one of us closer unto you in Jesus' name. Keep us awake and drive sleep from every one of us. 
that we may get the best out of your watch tonight. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered us. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to a kind of rounding of study in Daniel chapter 4. In Daniel chapter 4, we've gone through quite a lot in this chapter. And tonight, we want to bring everything together and look at the purpose why we learn. And why we have seen and we have heard what we have heard. If you ask any one of our children going to school, primary school in particular, why are you coming to school? Those children do not know left from right. They don't know why they are going to school. Daddy dropped me here and said it's going to work. And I think daddy just wants me to be in this place. Or mommy wants me here until they come back from work. They don't understand what they're learning, the majority of them. Even if you ask those who are in the secondary school and you say, why are you coming to school? Why are you learning this and learning this and learning that? They do not have any clue, any idea why they are learning what they are learning. That's why you find some of those students in school that they just become like runaway children. They are not in class when they ought to be in class. They are not paying attention when they need to pay attention because they do not know that the things they are learning is preparing them for the future. And sometimes you'll find, even those of us who are adults, it may be that our company, our organization sends us to a particular cause. And we take it as normal, we take it as usual. They give opportunities like that to workers in our corporation, in our organization. And it is my turn now. And if I do this, I'll come back, I'll be able to have promotion. They do not understand the reason why they go for the conference, they go to learn what they go to learn. For us who are coming to learn from the word of God, we must know why the Lord has sent us here to learn. And you must understand every time you come to the Bible study, I am here for a purpose. The Lord is preparing me for something. He's teaching me something. That's why he's brought me here. We're looking at Romans chapter 15 verse 4. Romans chapter 15 verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, Daniel is part of that. Daniel chapter 4 is a very major part of what things were written aforetime. They were written for our learning. That take hold of that word. Learn, learn. They were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. It tells us then that these things we're learning and these things we're reading is for a purpose. We're to learn so that we will be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And the knowledge of the truth we come to will then help us to be what we ought to be in life. And there was something that bothered, that concerned the Apostle Paul. Well, the people that were learning and hearing the word of God. And he expressed that concern in Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. What a deep concern. And that will be a deep concern to any parent, any father, any mother. That will be a deep concern to any principal of a school, any teacher. That will be a great concern to any proprietor of any school. That he establishes the school and then he puts competent, capable teachers there. And those children are learning and they are never able to pass any exam. It's a great, a deep concern. And for those who are preaching the word of God, for those who are teaching Monday after Monday, and Tuesday after Tuesday, or week after week, and we're learning from the Word of God, when we look at the lives of the people who are learning, it's a deep, it's a great concern. If there is no change, no transformation, no evidence of the things they're learning, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, we've read chapter 4. You know the story already. You could almost tell me from verse 1 to verse 37 what is contained in Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 contains the judgment of God that came upon Nicodemus. That terrible judgment, that strange punishment that came upon him. The question is, 
why would we learn about the judgment? Why would we learn about the punishment that came upon a man long, long ago? What's my concern with that? What's your concern with that? Your concern is this, to learn something. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are there, like we have read in Daniel chapter 4, when thy judgments are there, the inhabitants of the world will do what? Learn righteousness. That means then, as we see the dealings of God with Nebuchadnezzar, and we see the judgment that came upon him, the reason why that he preserved in the word of God, and the reason why we're reading it, and analyzing it, and explaining it, and applying it to our lives, the reason for that is that the inhabitants of the world may learn righteousness. What else are we to learn when we see those things? that come upon the unbelievers, upon the people that do not know the Lord. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31. I want you to look at verse 12. Open your Bible and mark these verses of scripture. Don't just uh, keep it in the outline and say, yes, it's in the outline. The outline might fly away. The wind might blow it away. But when you mark it in your Bible, you know it's there. And you can refer to it another time. We're looking at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31. I'm reading verse 12. Gather the people together, the men and the women and the children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this Lord. Have you noticed there it says, the men? Let them be there. The women, let them be there. Even the children, let them all be there together. And what are they to do? They are to learn the word of God. It says that they may hear and that they may learn. What are they learning? That they may learn to fear the Lord your God. The reason why we're learning all this is so that we'll be able to learn to fear the Lord God Almighty. And to know that God is so great, and that His sword is very sharp, and that we cannot hold the sword by its blade, that if we do, it will cut us to pieces until we will not be recognized anymore. Look at verse 13, and that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn. Even their children which have not known anything as we read about Nebuchadnezzar as we read about the judgments of God on the earth, as we read about God's attitude to pride and to evil, it says that even their children may learn to fear the Lord your God as long as ye live in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it we're told then that the reason why we're studying all this is so that we'll be able to learn. And as we learn, we're learning to fear the Lord because this is a great and mighty God. Deuteronomy chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 13. It's still emphasizing the same thing, you know. When God says something over and over and over again. And it says, learn. And it says, hear it. And when you hear, learn from it. Take a lesson, an unforgettable lesson from what you learned, that you may learn to fear me all the days of your life. In Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 11, here is what it says. And all Israel shall hear. All Israel shall hear. All Israel, how many, how many in Israel should hear? Oh, I praise the Lord for those of you coming to the Bible study. But you know, sometimes uh, there are some people you see them on Sunday in our church. You don't see them on Monday. It's like they think, I don't need that. I've got enough. I've read enough. And I've heard all that they preach on Sunday. Why should I be there on Monday? 
And you know, if you were really to help people to love God more, to learn more, to fear God more, to be what they ought to be, you'll be encouraging the members of the church that all, everyone will be able to come and you'll be able to learn. If you're a leader in the church, you'll not say, well, you know, the, the people of nowadays, they're so busy. I remember in our days when, we, you know, we were young, we were members of the church and not workers, we'll be running to the Bible study. But you know, the young people of nowadays and the members of the church nowadays, this is the way they are. It is too much looking into this and getting this and getting that. If you're a leader in the church, you'll not have an attitude like that. You'll do your very best to get all the people of God together. That all the people of God will come. And then they will learn. Look at verse 11. And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more evil, no more any such wickedness as this is among you. You see the reason why we are to learn so that the fear of God will be in our hearts. We'll say, ah, he dealt with Nebuchadnezzar that way. I've had that. I've learned that. I fear the Lord. I will not allow that to come upon me. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verse 13. 17 verse 13. It says in verse 13, and how many people? Tell me out loud. Uh, you see this, we're failing God. If we just come alone to the Bible study and we say, the, the people, the other, they had the announcement on Sunday, there's Bible study on Monday, why don't they come? Make an effort. Help people. Encourage people. Lead them on. To be able to obey the Lord more. In verse 13, all the people shall hear and do what? And fear and do no more presumptuously. Look at verse 19 of that same chapter 17. And it shall be with him that he shall reach therein all the days of his life. That he may learn to fear the Lord is God. That's the reason why we're learning. It's not just to learn and then to just say, well, I learned something today. Let it affect your life. And let it make you fear the Lord. And let it make you consciously want to obey the Lord. That he may learn to fear the Lord is God to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Deuteronomy chapter 19 verse 20. Chapter 19 verse 20. It says, And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. It's very clear then as we look at the word of God. That the reason why we're studying the word of God is that we will hear, we will learn, we will fear the Lord our God. And we're coming to now, we're coming to Daniel chapter 4. I've shown you the reason why we're all here. Why I am here, why you are here, why we are all here together. We want to learn. And as we learn, then we'll fear the Lord our God. We're looking at Daniel chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 30. The king spake and said, it's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty while the word was in the king's mouth. There fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. And they shall make thee eat grass and as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth thee to whomsoever he will. The same hour, the same hour was the sin fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his ears were grown like eagles' feathers and his nails like birds' claws. And then it says in verse 34, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. Did he learn something? I said, did he learn something? 
Yes, he did. What did he learn? Look at verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the armies of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Now in verse 37, I in Nebuchadnezzar, I praise, I extol, I honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride, what did he learn? Is able to a base. Now, we're dividing the message of three parts tonight. Number one, a clarion call to fear God the Most High. A clarion call. That's what clarion means, loud and clear. A call that is loud and clear to fear God the Most High. Number two, a clear command to fear God the Most High. Number three, continual condemnation for not fearing God the Most High. Number one, a clarion call to fear God the most high. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. There is a call coming from heaven. There's a call coming from the messengers of God that we ought to fear God the most high. Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 7. It says, Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. He says, who will not fear you? Who will stop bondly hiding himself against you? Because you are the king of nations and there is none like thee. Verse 10, but the Lord is the true God. God, he is the living God, an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Well, Nebuchadnezzar got a first-hand knowledge of that, but personal experience. That's the reason why we have that great call, clear call, loud call, clarion call, to fear the Lord our God. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 22. Jeremiah 5, verse 22. It says, Fear not ye me, says the Lord. The Lord is surprised that an ant can be bold and hardened against an elephant. The Lord is so much surprised that a rat will stay in front of a lion and put bold and courageous and audacious. And the Lord God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, before whom all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, is asking a great question. He's saying in that verse 22, Fear ye not me, says the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bounds of the sea by perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it? And though yet, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet can they not pass over it. The Lord is telling us then that the path of wisdom, for every human being, the path of wisdom for every descendant from Adam is that we'll fear the Lord. In Revelation chapter, chapter 15, Revelation chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation 15 verse 4. Here we're told, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Who shall not fear thee? Is there a Pharaoh? Is there Nebuchadnezzar? Is there, is there Belshazzar? Is there Herod that will not fear the Lord? He will taste the wine cup of his wrath and indignation. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. Thy judgments, you see the reason for fearing God, because the judgments of God are made plain, are made clear, are made manifest. It tells us in Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach 
unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people was the angel with this everlasting gospel was he declaring to the people. Verse 7 saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. Fear God and give glory to him. It's, it's not only the, uh, the preachers or the prophets of the Old Testament and the New Testament, even the angel of God in heaven. Having this everlasting gospel to declare unto all the inhabitants of the earth. It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And you see the judgment is linked to fearing God. It says, the hour of his judgment is come. And see the might of God and the power of God. And, and see what God can do in bringing judgment to any rebellious sinner. It says, because of that, Fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment is come and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Now, as you look at this um, uh, understanding, you look at this subject of fearing God. For the people of the Old Testament, that, that was normal. That was, uh, that was clear because of the dispensation in which they lived. And because of the great, sweet, a judgment, urgent thing that came upon them, the fear of God, they were conscious of that. It's when you come to the New Testament, many, many people, they do not link the fear of God with New Testament doctrine, New Testament understanding. And the people of God, well, the New Testament dispensation, they say, we are saved, he is our father, and we are his children. How can you fear God? And the people in the New Testament, they talk about being sanctified, were sanctified and made holy. And so how can you fear God once you are sanctified? The people in the New Testament say, we are the children of God. And he has given us the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. What the Holy Ghost in us, and what the Comforter abiding and living within us, how can we fear God? And let's, let's, let's teach ourselves tonight. And let us look at the Word of God. We are saved. We have grace. We perceive of the love of God. Do we still need to fear God? Let the New Testament give us the answer that now, now that we're born again, now that we're children of God, and we rejoice in the grace of God. Grace and fear, do they go together? Let's see. In Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 28. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Wherefore, we receive in our kingdom, which cannot be moved, let us have, have what? Grace. That's New Testament. And this is what Christ brought on the cross of Calvary. Let us have grace, where, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and what? Godly fear. You see the grace, you see the godly fear. And then he says, why, why do we fear God? It says in verse 29, For our God is a consuming fire. Now you see many people, they only think about the love of God. He loves us so much, for God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the understanding people have from that is, God is so loving, He has forgiven my sins. God is so loving, there is forgiveness with Him. And since he loves me and he forgives me, what do I need to fear? What do I need to fear him for? Let's look at Psalm 130, Psalm 130. We're looking at verse 4, Psalm 130. Verse 4. It says, But there is what? Forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. There is forgiveness with thee. Now, when, when God gives us forgiveness, and that's not to make us say, Hello, God, how are you today? That's, it doesn't make us familiar with God. Or to make God our equal, we fear Him. We say, This God is so high and He's so great. I could have been stricken dead. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But it's so magnanimous, it's so merciful, it's so compassionate that he has pardoned my sin. And because of that, I have reverential fear for him. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. 
in the end, after we're saved, we're also sanctified. We're, uh, when we're sanctified, it, it purifies our heart. It cleanses our heart. It gives us another heart. And now, after we're sanctified, uh, do we need to fear God? Think about that. We're saved, and it says you have grace now. There must be godly fear of that grace. And now you are forgiven because you are forgiven. Psalm 130 verse 4, that thou mightest be feared. Now we are sanctified. Look at the promise of sanctification in, Je- in Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. What a joy we have that we're not the people of God. They shall be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way. I will give them one heart and one way. Why? That they may fear me forever. Not only in the Old Testament, that they may fear me in the Old Testament in the New Testament, beyond the New Testament, for ages, generation after generation, dominion after dominion, kingdom after kingdom, forever, that they may fear me forever. You see that, that, that we're saved, and then we're sanctified, and it gives us one heart, it gives us a heart of flesh, it gives us a new heart. It says, the reason I'm sanctifying you, the reason I'm taking away that Adamic nature, the reason I'm making you holy, is so that you'll fear me forever for the good of them, and of their children after them, in verse 40, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts. This is the promise of sanctification, that it gives us this clean heart, new heart, righteous heart, holy heart, purified heart. He gives them one heart and in giving them that heart, he says, I'll put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. I pray that God will help us will not depart from the Lord in Jesus' name. And now, what of when we're baptized in the Holy Ghost? After all, we know that when the Holy Ghost comes, He is the Comforter. We're filled with the Holy Ghost according to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but she know him, because therefore he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. He gives us the comfort of the Spirit of God. After we are baptized in the Holy Ghost and we have that comfort of the Spirit, I understand now, we are saved. We have grace, must have the fear of God. I understand now, we're sanctified. He gives us a new heart, a clean heart, a purified heart, and he still puts in us the fear of God. What if we're not baptized in the Holy Ghost? And we have the comfort of living within us, and we're walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. After that comfort has come, any fear of God, look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verse 31. Acts, chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the church's rest, throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking how? Tell me out loud. Walking in the fear of the Lord and in what? In the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. The comfort of the Holy Ghost that comes of the Holy Ghost baptism that was there. And yet they were walking in the fear of the Lord. You see, there, there's no experience we may have. And there's no understanding we may have. There's no spiritual attainment that we can possess that the privilege or privilege may have in the kingdom of God or whatever intimacy we have with the God of heaven. There must still be that fear of God. God in our hearts. We'll come to point number two. A clear command. A clear command to fear God the most high. A clear command to fear God the most high. Now, when we're, t- when we're talking about fear, 
sometimes when you read your Bible, uh, you have to understand what the Lord is saying. You know, sometimes the Bible will say, fear not. Have you heard that before? Fear not. And then you, you come to Genesis, it says, fear not. You go to Exodus, it says, fear not. And then you come to First Samuel, fear not. Then you come to First Kings, fear not. You are coming to eyesight after 41. It says, fear not. I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And I once we hear that part of the word, and it says, fear not, then we think that means fear not is fear not. What it means is, Fear not the enemy. It doesn't say not, don't fear God. It says, fear not about your problem. Fear not about the sickness. Fear not about the challenge. Fear not about the Philistines. Fear not about the Amalekites. Fear not about this. Fear not any man. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That's what he's talking about. Fear not. But when it comes to your relationship with God, we cannot say fear not. Let me show you. Exodus chapter 20, verse 20. You're going to see those two things right there. Exodus chapter 20 verse 20. You must open this. This is very, very important. Exodus 20 verse 20. Have you opened it? Tell me so I can read. Thank you very much. Exodus 20, 20. Notice what we're talking about. And Moses said unto the people, what? Fear not. For God is come to prove you that that." What is fear may be before your faces that ye see not. Do you see the two together there? Moses spoke to the people and Moses said, fear not. Why did he say that? Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they they removed and stood afar off and they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. He said, Fear not, you are not going to die. That's what it means. Fear not, the thunderings is not to, not to kill you. Fear not, all the lightnings you see, they are not supposed to kill you. Fear not, God loves you, and God wants to protect you, and God will preserve you. Don't fear any trouble, don't fear any death, and don't fear any calamity. Fear not, but the Lord is appearing before you that, in that verse 20, is fear may be before your eyes, before your faces, that ye sin not which means then we don't fear evil we don't fear satan we don't fear man we don't fear any problem we don't fear any circumstance but we still fear god that's the command that he has given us leviticus chapter 25 i'm reading from verse 17 leviticus 25 let's look at verse 17 In verse 17 it says, Ye shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God. For I am the Lord your God. That's what it means. Don't oppress anyone. Why? Because you fear God. Thou shalt fear the Lord your God. This is the child of God. What if I'm going to school of the child of a president, the president of our country? And I know that this child is a beloved child to the president of our country. And then I happen to be the senior prefect of that school. And I know that this is child of president. I'll be very careful because of the honor and the respect I have for our president. I will take care of his child and not oppress the child. The same thing, we're children of the king. And every child of God is a child of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the Lord is saying, the fear I want you to have for me. It's not the fear when the thunder strikes. That's not the fear. It's not the fear when there's a terrible rain and then the wind is taking the roof of houses. That's not the fear I want you to have. The fear I want you to have for me is look at my children. And don't oppress my children. And don't persecute my children. And don't annoy my children. Take care of my children more than you will take care of the child of 
your president in your country. That's what it means when it says we should fear him. It said in us in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're looking at verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. That's the fear he's talking about. We fear him and we serve him. Uh, you know, you know. Sometimes uh, you are at home and you are a little bit weak in the body, and you know that you know you, you go to a place of work, and you know they are retrenching people, they are removing people from their work because they say I want to cut off, uh, you know, some of these people that are really are just taking salary, and we don't really need them. And now you are a little bit weak, but you have not told them in the place of work you are not coming, and you know that they are they are looking for the people they are going to retrench. What the little weakness you have, little problem you have, you'll dress up, you still go to work. Won't you go? I say, will you not go? Oh, you don't want to lose your job. That's a fear. He says, now, if you can do that for secular employment, if you can do that to a secular employer, you have a little bit of problem, a little bit of pain, a little bit of pressure, and you have to serve the Lord. The same fear that you are. For your employer, I don't want them to terminate my appointment. And because of that, although I'm feeling a little bit weak, but I have to go so that they will not uh, stop my employment. It says in that same way, thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him. Don't use little, little excuses. And say, because of this, I cannot serve the Lord. Because of this, I cannot serve the Lord. Fear the Lord and serve the Lord. And that's what the Lord is telling us there. He tells us in Psalm 33, verse, verse 8. Psalm 33, verse 8. Now he tells us how many are to fear the Lord. Is it only people who are, you know, in the church or people outside there? Psalm 33, verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. It says all the earth, virtually, literally, everyone were to fear the Lord. It's not just some special group of people that have to fear the Lord. We ought to fear the Lord. I'm going to ask you a question. Who are the people to fear the Lord? How limited is this commandment to fear the Lord? How universal is this commandment to fear the Lord? Number one, all the children of God are commanded to fear the Lord. All the children of God are commanded to fear the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 24. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're reading from verse 24. In verse 24, it says, And the Lord commanded us, all his children, to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, for our good, for our good. Whether it's in the private, in the secret, or in the public, it's for our good. Whether people are there or not, this is for our good. Because we know the Lord is watching us. His eyes behold all the actions of men. Because of that, whether my wife is there or not, my husband is there or not, my pastor is there or not, my leader is there or not, members of the church are there or not, I know this is what the word of the Lord commands. And because that's what the word commands, that's the reason why I fear the Lord, I honor him, I obey him. It says, for our good, that he might preserve us alone life as it is at this day. Number two, all the beneficiaries of the promises of God concerning sonship. All the beneficiaries of the promises of the Lord. Those are the people to fear him. We're looking at second at second Corinthians chapter six. Second Corinthians chapter six verse seventeen. Wherefore come out from among them and be you separate, says the, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Move on to chapter 7, verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, you're a beneficiary of the promises of God. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness how in the fear of god new testament now new testament perfecting holiness in the fear of god and as uh, the commandment he has given us now number three all true believers in christ 
all followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the friends of Christ, all the disciples of Christ, they are to, they are to fear the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and we're reading from verses 4 and 5. Luke chapter 12, verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ talking. Was he talking to the Pharisees? Sadducees? Publicans? Who was he talking to? His own disciples, my friends. He says, but, and I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them which kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him. This Christ talking. Talking to his own disciples. And talking to those already children of God in the kingdom of God. Christ says, fear him. Who after, which after he has killed has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Number four, all the saints of God are commanded to fear him. Those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, purified by the blood of the Lamb, and they are saints of God. These saints are supposed to fear the Lord. In Psalm 34, we're reading verse 9. Psalm 34, reading from verse 9. O oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints. You know, there are people that have the idea as if, well, I'm not a sinner. Why should I fear God? I'm a child of God, saved and sanctified. Why should I fear God? I'm a disciple of Christ. Why should I fear God? I'm a saint, a saint of the Lord. Why should I fear God? That's exactly the reason why you need to fear the Lord, reverence the Lord, honor the Lord, exalt the Lord, and fear the Lord to the point you say, no, I will not sin, I will not do any evil, because I'm a saint of God, I fear the Lord. It's Psalm 34 verse 9, Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no one to them that fear the Lord. Number five, all who have been blessed by God are commanded to fear him. If God has blessed you at any time, saved you, he has blessed you he has healed you, he has blessed you he has delivered you, he has blessed you he has protected you, he has blessed you he has provided for you he has blessed you, he has put you in a conspicuous position to serve him, that's a blessing if the Lord has blessed you at any time then you are one of those people that are supposed to fear the Lord because of the blessing He has granted you, we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 24 1 Samuel chapter 12 verse 24 only fear the lord and serve him in truth with all your heart for consider how great things he has done for you when the lord has blessed you you don't become so familiar and then holding in contempt after all he has to bless me after all, I enjoyed this, I enjoyed this, I enjoyed that in the kingdom. The very fact that the Lord has singled you out and made you, and made you a partaker of the blessing of the Lord, that should make you to fear the Lord. Only fear the Lord and serve Him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things He has done for you. Number six, all the inhabitants of the world are commanded to fear the Lord. All the inhabitants of the world, if you're still alive, an inhabitant of this earth, and the Lord has given you the solid ground on which you walk, and the Lord is supplying the air you breathe, and the Lord wakes you up every morning when you sleep at night, you don't know where you are, and it is the mercy of the Lord you're sleeping and waking up. If the Lord is giving you bread to eat and water to drink, and is nourishing you and making you to grow, if the Lord is protecting you from all the unseen evils in all the earth, and you're part of the inhabitants of this world, and in Him we move and we live and we have our being. If you are a person 
and dwelling in this house of the Lord, in this place of the Lord. Because it says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And then it's giving you all that chance. What are you to do? You are to fear the Lord, all the inhabitants of the earth. We're looking at Psalm, Psalm 33, Psalm 33 verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord and let all the inhabitants of the world fear, stand in awe of him. Number seven, every man. Every man without exception, you and I, you and your brother, you and your wife, you and your husband, you and your children, and you and your parents, you and your neighbors, you and your brothers and sisters, everyone on the face of the earth, every man is commanded to fear God, the Lord most high. We're looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. Fear God. When you fear God, what will that translate to in your life? You'll keep His commandments. If you really fear God, if you want to honor God, and if you respect God so much, you're going to keep the commandments of the Lord. It says, fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment. And every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. And let's come to the New Testament now in Second Corinthians chapter seven verse one. Second Corinthians chapter seven verse one. Having therefore these promises daily beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfecting what? Perfecting what? Holiness in the fear of God. Pick up that word. Perfecting holiness. By the way, what's that holiness? And it says you're perfecting it. You're improving on it. You're increasing in it. You're maturing in that holiness. Perfecting holiness in what? In the fear of God. I want to tell you tonight the components of that holiness. That were to perfect in the fear of God. H is for humility. We're to keep on perfecting humility. Increasing in humility. Maturing in humility, walking in humility, rejoicing in humility, and moving on and on in humility in the fear of God. We're looking at Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 18, verses 3 and 4, and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. How important is humility? Perfecting humility, increasing in humility all the days of your life in the fear of God. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient. He humbled himself and became obedient. When it says perfecting holiness and the fear of God, perfecting humility in the fear of God. And the reason why you are humble, the reason why you are lowly, the reason why you are meek is because it's a component, it's part of holiness. And without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without humility, no one shall see the Lord. Except you be converted and become as one of these Little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now it says, and be found in fashion. As a man, he humbled himself and became what? Tell me, obedient. Now, the next component of that holiness is 
obedience. And when it, when it says perfecting holiness in the fear of God, it means perfecting obedience in the fear of God. Without obedience, what is holiness if there's no obedience? Obedience to the word of the Lord. Keeping the word of the Lord. How can a man say, I'm holy and there's no obedience in his life? How can a man say, I'm holy and it's not obeying God, not obeying the commandments of God? But we're talking about fear. Is there obedience or fear? Look at it. We're looking at Deuteronomy chapter 13 and reading from verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verse 4. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. In the same verse, fear him, obey his voice. Obey his voice and fear him. Perfecting obedience in the fear of God. You'll see how the, how the Lord joins all these things together. In 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, we're looking at verse 14. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey be his voice. You see that if he will fear the Lord and obey his voice, if he will fear the Lord and obey his voice, which means then, as we say, we're perfecting holiness and the fear of God, we're perfecting, we're increasing our obedience and the fear of the Lord. In First Peter chapter 1, First Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 14. First Peter chapter 1 verse 14. As obedient children, you see that? Obedient children. When you come into the kingdom of God, you become a child of God. The fear of God we're talking about is a fear that makes the number one humble, perfecting humility in the fear of the Lord, and perfecting obedience in the fear of the Lord. As obedient children of fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am, am what? I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons, judges every, judges according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here, how? In fear. You see that? Obedience, verse 14, it goes on to the holy life and then concludes with fear. That means then you're perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You're perfecting humility and you're perfecting also obedience in the fear of the Lord. L, the component of L is love. Love. Now, this is another thing that you know many people do not understand. And many people do not want to understand that when you love God, then you fear Him. And that actually, those two things are joined together, you know. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy chapter 10. I'm reading to you from verse 12 and verse 13. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. It says in verse 12, And now Israel, what does the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all his ways and then to do what? And to love him. You see this. It says it's to fear the Lord your God and then it moves on to obeying the word of God and then to love him. And so if in your mind you have been thinking, I'm just going to love the Lord, I'm not going to fear the Lord. You see that you're not scriptural. You are standing on one leg. And the wind of human nature will pull you down, will, will just push you down. But when you stand on both legs, it says, fear the Lord and love him. And so you're perfecting love in the fear of the Lord. You're yielding yourself to the Lord more and more, and you love him. And then it tells us in Psalm 97 verse 10. Psalm 97, I'm reading to you from verse 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. That's the love. That's the love. When it says perfecting holiness and the fear of God, it means, you know, there are some evil things in the world. 
in character, evil in morals, evil in the society. And because you love the Lord as a component of your holiness, the things that are of the world and the things that will pollute you and defile you and corrupt you, you hate them. And you're perfecting that hatred that today you hate the things of the world more than many years ago. The pollutions and the corruptions and the evil and the things of the world, you hate them today more than you ever did because you're increasing in that love of God. It says, ye that love the Lord hate evil. You will hate evil. He preserved the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hands of the wicked. He will deliver you. The eye there is integrity. Integrity means you stand like a capital I. The wind will blow. The pain might rack your body. The persecution might come from every direction. And the deprivation from the people of the world might come. And there might be adverse circumstances beating against your life. You stand firm like a capital I, like they say, the rock of Gibraltar. And you do not allow anything to move you away from your commitment and consecration to the Lord. That's integrity. And that integrity is part of holiness. And you are to perfect that integrity in the fear of the Lord. In Job chapter 2, Job chapter 2 I'm reading to you from verse 3 Job chapter 2 verse 3 and the Lord said unto Satan, as thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man one that does what? feareth God, that is it one that feareth God God and then and is true as evil and still he holdeth fast his integrity. Can you see those two things together? He feareth God and he is holding on to his integrity. And then the Lord say, Although thou moves me against him to destroy him without cause. The pain came, the sickness came, the boils came all over the body. The accusations came. Every negative thing in the land came against his life. But he said, I'm going to hold on to my integrity. In fact, the integrity was challenged in verse 9. In verse 9, then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Look at everything that has happened. All the reverses of life, they have come to you. Are you still holding on to your integrity? Because God and I, but you said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh, What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his Lives. He held on to his integrity. That's holiness. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting integrity in the fear of God. That whatever the pain, whatever the persecution, whatever the circumstance, and whatever the reverses of life, job or no job, charge or no charge, Marriage or no marriage yet, accommodation or no accommodation, friends or foe, whatever the winds of circumstance may beat at you, holding on to your integrity. That's the holiness we're talking about. That whatever may be happening, you're still standing like Job's church. And the grace that God gave him, God will give you that grace. N is for the new nature. Perfecting holiness, perfecting the new nature. Improving on the new nature. Increasing that new nature. Strengthening that new nature. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Perfecting the new nature in the fear of God. That is holiness. That every time you wake up in the morning, I'm a new creature. I mean, I have new nature in me. And whatever may happen today, whatever friends may do, and whatever enemies may do, 
this new nature in me will come out brighter today. Perfecting holiness, perfecting the new nature in the fear of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 24. Ephesians chapter 4, we're looking at verse 24. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, it says, And ye put on the new man, that's the new nature, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. It tells us in Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verses 3 and 4, according as his divine powers given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye may be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. That new nature is a nature of holiness. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God is perfecting the new nature in the fear of God. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. E is for endurance. Uh, you know, in this life, as you go through life, holiness is enduring. Holiness is enduring. You see many people backsliding. Holiness is enduring. Enduring to the end. You see many people compromising. Holiness is enduring. And saying, yes, I know why they are running away. I know why they are compromising. I know why they are kind of changing their principles. But holiness is enduring. I'm going to endure to the very end. I know why their love is waxing cold. I know what they say they are facing. I'm facing that too, but I'm going to endure Holiness is enduring. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24 verse 12 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 24 verses 12 and 13. It says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. What does it mean? Perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord, perfecting endurance, perfecting endurance, and perfecting endurance. This thing is coming at me today. There will be no complaint. Today, there will be no murmuring. Today, there will be no canal comparison. Why is this happening to me and it's not happening to other people? I'm perfecting endurance. You know, you used to, maybe you used to endure, but a lot of grumbling within, a lot of complaint within, a lot of wishing it were not like this, but now you are perfecting endurance of the fear of the Lord. And therefore, those things are happening and not, there's no disturbance inside your heart now. You are not moved at all. You say, I'm holding on to my integrity. I'm going to endure to the very end and my endurance will not be, I'm just sitting there gritting my teeth and almost cursing the people in my heart. But now you love them while you're enduring and you appreciate the good things of the Lord while you're enduring. Perfecting endurance in the fear of the Lord. And that's perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. And then as the submission, submission. Now you bend low before the Lord, you are yielding to the Lord. You are perfecting holiness. You are perfecting submission. O Lord, thy will be done. I don't understand this. If I wish, I would have wanted you to take this cup away from me, but not as I will, but as thou wilt. A Father which art in heaven, our Lord be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth. That will of God to be done on earth may be inconvenient for me. I'm perfecting submission in the fear of the Lord. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God is is perfecting submission in the fear of the Lord. But you know, if something is happening, no, I don't like this, I don't want this, why should it be like this? I'm going to do this and do that until this church will change the scene. If it was on my head, they're going to change this. I don't care whether they break my head, this scene will change. You're not perfecting holiness, you're perfecting evil. 
You're maturing evil. You're increasing in evil. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God is perfecting submission in the fear of the Lord. You're not doing that because of any man, because of so and so, because of such and such, because of my fear for God, because of my honor for God. I'm perfecting holiness and perfecting submission in the fear of the Lord. We're looking at Romans chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 13. Romans chapter 6 and we're looking at verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. That's submission. Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Submission, submission, and you're perfecting that submission. And your submission today is better than your submission last year. Your submission this year is better than your submission 10 years ago. Your humility, your meekness, your surrender this time is better than your submission and yieldedness in years gone by. Because you are perfecting holiness and perfecting submission in the fear of the Lord. In James chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 7. James chapter 4 verse 7, submit yourselves therefore unto God. That's submission. Submit yourselves therefore unto God. And now the last is self-denial. The components of holiness, humility. Obedience, love, integrity, a new nature, endurance, submission, and then self-denial. And when it says you perfect holiness, it means you take all these components one by one in your life. And then you are increasing in them. You are maturing in them. You are perfecting them. You are brightening them, making them brighter to shine more and more until the perfect day in your life. Self-denial, we're looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Here it says, And he and he said unto them, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself. Self-denial. Let him deny himself and take up his cross. How often? Daily. And follow me. And then you're asking yourself, can I deny myself today of something I couldn't deny myself of last week? Is my self-denial increasing today than it did last year? Can I forgo? Can I give up? Can I abandon? Can I give up something today that I couldn't give up two years ago? Perfecting self-denial. In the fear of the Lord. And that means you're improving. That means you're increasing. That means you're growing. Because you're perfecting holiness, perfecting humility. You're perfecting holiness, perfecting obedience. You're perfecting holiness, perfecting love. You're perfecting integrity, perfecting holiness. Perfecting holiness, you're perfecting new nature. Perfecting holiness, you're perfecting the endurance. Perfecting holiness, you're perfecting submission. Perfecting holiness, you're perfecting self-denial. You're increasing more and more. And by the grace of God will shine more and more until the perfect day in Jesus' name. I need a good amen from Headquarters Church. Amen. And because you see, when you perfect it, you're increasing in it, and then you'll be shining brighter and brighter. Job chapter 17, verse 9. Job chapter 17, we're looking at verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger i think that is you i say that is you you'll be shining brighter and brighter in jesus name we come to point number three point number three continual condemnation for not fearing god the most high not fearing god the most high you see the judgment that came upon the people that didn't fear god and because they did not fear God, it says judgment came upon them in First Samuel chapter 12. First Samuel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 25, uh, from verse 14 and 15. For Samuel chapter 12. Reading from verse 14. If ye will fear the Lord and serve him, 
and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of the Lord. Then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you, as it was against your fathers. We will fear the Lord. The hand of the Lord will not be against us. We will enjoy the promises and the blessings of God in Jesus' name. Second Kings chapter 17. Second Kings chapter 17 verse 25. Second Kings 17 25. And it was so at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. They feared not the Lord. They, these people living in the earth the Lord has made and living in the place the Lord had given them free. And then they were living and moving and increasing in number. And yet they will not fear the Lord. It says they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. The Lord sent lions among them which slew some of them. Maybe somebody there is in our olden days. Lions, slaying people, destroying people. Then you say, not today. Let's look at First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. We're looking at verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion. As a roaring lion. Walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The people that do not fear the Lord, that's their Lord. Because in those Old Testament times, the literal lion came and slew them. But today, it is the devil. It is Satan. It is that running lion. And it says he's going about seeking whom he may devour. And the people that do not have the fear of the Lord, the Lord will not protect them. They will be devoured by that lion. We're looking at Psalm 36, reading from verse 1. Psalm 36, verse 1. It says in verse 36, verse 1, The transgression of the wicked saith, Within my heart there is no fear of God before his eyes. No fear of God before his eyes. What's the consequence of that? Verse 12, There are the workers of iniquity falling. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29. Proverbs chapter 1. What do you mean from verse 29? For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They hated knowledge. They hated teaching. They hated doctrine they hated the commandments of the word of the lord because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the lord they would not they would none of my counsel they departed they depart they despise all my reproof therefore shall they eat of the fruits of their own of their own way and be filled with their own devices for the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them you see what came upon Nebuchadnezzar that strange punishment that came upon him. It was because at that time, he did not fear the God of heaven. Sinners and the Gentile world were not excused from the responsibility of fearing God. God demanded that he, the creator, the preserver of man, be honored and feared and obeyed. Lack of fear and regard for him was always punished blasphemy and pride were always visited with divine wrath. Nebuchadnezzar's punishment lasted for seven years, but you understand that the punishment of Belshazzar continues throughout eternity. It's unending, it's everlasting. Kings and princes, great men and great women, atheists and philosophers, and mighty men, wealthy men who sin against God, neither fearing God nor regarding man will bear their guilt, their sorrow, their shame, their suffering, for all eternity 
while in hell, while in wells, they harden themselves against God, and they live in sin without any form of fear. They fear not the God of heaven in whose hand is, is their breath. Many of them may learn too late that their destiny is in God's hand. But we are learning it today, and this lesson we're learning will be beneficial to every one of us in Jesus' name. That's why it's saying in Psalm 2, Psalm 2 reading from verse 10 some 2 verse 10 here it says be wise now therefore you have been at the bible study today you've learned you have heard everything the lord has taught us and the lord is saying be wise now therefore O ye kings O ye men of the earth be instructed ye judges of the earth serve the lord with fear and rejoice with trembling kiss the son love the son Believe the Son. Embrace the Son. Believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. Accept the Lord Jesus Christ. And befriend the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Kiss the Son. Lest he be angry. Ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled both for a little. Blessed are all they. I am blessed. I said I am blessed. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You have come today to learn, and I pray this thing you have learned today will contribute your spiritual progress in Jesus' name. You love the Lord today, love him more. You trust the Lord today, trust him more. You fear the Lord today, fear him more. You obey the Lord today, obey him more. You are keeping to integrity today, keep to that integrity more. You are serving the Lord today, serve him more. And every day of your life, every moment of your life, you are perfecting holiness and moving on holiness in the fear of the Lord. And by the grace of God, when the trumpet sounds, we shall be together in glory. Shall we rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, we thank you for what we have learned today. See what the Lord has taught us that now we understand that we have the grace of God, but also serve Him with godly fear. And now we're sanctified, He must put His fear within our hearts. He has filled us with the Holy Ghost. He must also put His fear in our heart that we love the Lord, we fear the Lord, and we want to obey Him all the days of our lives. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord Himself will make what we have learned today. To be of tremendous benefit in your life. And remember, the reason why we're learning, there are many people that learn and they remain ever the same. They're not increasing in holiness. And they're not perfecting holiness. And the same corruption that was in them yesterday is still there today. And they're ever learning, ever learning, ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Don't let that be your Lord. Learn and grow. Learn and improve. Learn and increase. Learn and be steadfast. Learn and be stable. Learn and grow in the things of the Lord. Let the grace of God be in your life. We're receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Let us have grace and more grace. Let us have grace and greater grace. Let us have grace and deeper grace. Let us have grace and all sufficient grace whereby we'll be able to serve the Lord with reverence and with godly fear. You don't fear man, you don't fear Satan, you don't fear sickness, you don't fear calamity, you don't fear circumstances, but you fear the Lord. You fear the Lord. Tell the Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. Help me, Lord, to have a healthy fear, a saintly fear, a sanctified fear, a scriptural fear, so that I will serve you, I will worship you, I will honor you, I will obey you. Serve the Lord, fear the Lord. Serve the Lord, fear the Lord. Obey the Lord. What commandment has the Lord been giving you? And you have not been taking it to heart. You say, Lord, now I understand. Now I understand. Because I love you, because I fear you, because I honor you, because I want to glorify you. I take those commandments of God to heart from today. Lord, help me. What I've learned today, to learn to fear the Lord. To learn to fear the Lord. To learn to fear the Lord. In the public, in the private, in the family, in the church, in the neighborhood, in the, neighborhood, in the community. 
in the office, in the marketplace, to learn to fear the Lord. Our neighbors, the people around us, they do not understand what it means to fear the Lord. But we have come to learn. We are not in the same class with them. They are ignorant. We are knowledgeable. They do not know God. We know God. They do not know His word. We know His word. They do not know His demand. We know His commandment. And because we know what they do not know, that's why we're different from who they are. The Lord has given us a very clear explanation, exposition, application of his word. Now it is ours to be obedient to him, to fear the Lord. Fear the Lord your God. And the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, he has told us, we do not fear man, what man may do unto us, but he says, I will command you whom you will fear. Fear God, fear God, fear God, who after he has killed the body, has the power, has the ability to throw the soul into hell fire. He says, I say unto you, fear him. Tell the Lord, put your fear in my heart. Lord, put your fear in my heart. That anywhere I am, I will know that your eyes are watching me. And I will know that you are putting my life in the scales of your balance. Weighing my action, weighing my life, weighing my thoughts, weighing my reactions and responses. Oh Lord, put your fear in me that I will know anywhere I am, you are watching me, what I think, what I feel, what I do, and how I behave. Oh Lord, let me be conscious that you are with me every time. And your fear will make me to walk in righteousness and holiness. Your fear will make me to perfect holiness day by day in the fear of the Lord. Lord, I thank you for your commandment that you are made plain, you made clear. And Lord, help me that this clear word of God, I will live by it. That your salvation in me will reflect the honor, the respect, the fear I have for you. The sanctification experience you have given me, the putting of the Adamic nature, the purifying of my heart, the new covenant you have brought me into, that Lord, the cleansing, purification of the blood of the Lamb in this great second work of divine grace that wrought within me will come with this deeper fear of the Lord. You say you'll put your fear in them. Put it in me, Lord. Put it in me, Lord, that I'll be conscious of you every time, everywhere. That, Lord, my life will glorify you. My life will honor you. My life will be in obedience to your word. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of the Holy Ghost. For the presence of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the power of the Holy Ghost. Energizing me, empowering me, equipping me for your service. And Lord, I pray, the more I have of the comfort of this comforter from heaven, the more I'll be walking in the fear of the Lord. Conscious. Conscious that I carry something precious, precious ointment, so that my vessel will not crack, so that the oil will not pour away. Lord, that I'll be conscious of your presence with me, and I will jealously guard and protect that ointment and that unction of the Holy Ghost and the comfort of the Holy Ghost in my life. That I'll be walking every time, day and night, in the fear of the Lord. Lord, make me conscious. Make me conscious. Help me, Lord, so I don't live like the people of the world. 
who just live like animals and they think they will die like animals. Lord, make me a real peculiar child of God, a peculiar treasure. Walking, living, moving, acting, responding in the fear of the Lord. And Lord, let the fear of God in me cancel out, destroy every form of the fear of man that brings a snare. Lord, help me to perfect all the components of holiness fully, completely. In a balanced way, perfecting holiness, perfecting humility. Lord, help me by your grace that my humility will not dry up, fade away, will not leak out, will not be empty. Your meekness, your lowliness, your humility will be in me all the time. No proud word, no proud action, no proud disposition, no proud boastful kind of attitude. Perfecting humility. That the meekness and the lowliness of Christ will be seen in me in everything I do. Lord, help me perfecting obedience and the fear of the Lord. That I will not be careless like the people of the world. I will not be careless like all these other people that do not have the fear of God in their hearts. Oh Lord, just help me to know who I belong to. That I am a new creature in Christ. I belong to the Lord as a obedient child. Not fashioning myself according to the former laws in my ignorance. But now living a holy life. Obedience, perfecting that obedience in the fear of the Lord. Lord, perfect my love in the fear of the Lord. Loving the unlovable. Loving the children of God. Loving you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. Loving even my enemies because of the Lord. Not because of them. Not because of what they do or what they don't do. But loving them because of you. Perfecting love in the fear of the Lord. Help me, Lord. No grumbling again, no murmuring again, no gossiping again, no oppression again. Not doing anything evil to anybody. Oh Lord, help my integrity to stand firm until the glorious day. Now whatever winds may blow, whatever circumstances may bring, Lord, help me. I'll be standing like that capital I, unmovable, because I know you are with me, perfecting integrity in the fear of God. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help me to stand firm, courageous, bold, steadfast to the very edge. Not to fear what man may do unto me. In my office, help my integrity. Carrying out my responsibility, help my integrity. In the midst of the slander, help my integrity. In the midst of lying against me, help my integrity. In the midst of fighting against me, help my integrity. In the midst of people trying to pull you down, tell the Lord, help your integrity to help your integrity. That you will stand, you will not bend to the wishes of the people, but you will stand, stand, stand like that capital I. Improving, increasing, being firm in that integrity. That no matter what they say, no matter what they do, no matter how they act, no matter the circumstance, you'll be standing firm, uncompromising in the way of the Lord. Perfecting integrity in the fear of the Lord. That the new nature in you, 
be shining brighter and brighter, perfecting the new nature. Let the old nature die. Let the old nature be buried. Let the old nature wither. Let the old nature be taken away, thrown away. And let the new nature take preeminence and precedence in your life. Perfecting that new nature in the fear of the Lord. Perfecting endurance. No more complaining. No more fear. The ability to bear pain. The ability to bear insults. The ability to bear all the ridicules and the slander and the reproach of men. The ability to stand. Even in the midst of the slander and the persecution, enduring everything until the very end, perfecting endurance in the fear of the Lord, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord, perfecting submission. No more defending yourself, no more fighting back. No more knocking other people down. No more trampling upon other people so you can have your way. Submitting to the will of God. Lord, that will be done. Lord, that will be done. My friends, misunderstand me. Lord, that will be done. The persecutors have slandered me wrongfully, reproached me wrongfully. Lord, that will be done. I take pleasure in reproaches. I take pleasure in persecution, in the pressure. You're perfecting endurance and submission in the fear of the Lord. Submit to the will of God. And then let there be a higher, greater, deeper brother. Self-denial today that you ever felt in your life. Self-denial as we're growing older. Self-denial as we're increasing the things of the Lord. Perfecting self-denial in the fear of the Lord. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord.